Chapter 7 July 1970 Scrawled above the scruffy old double doors leading into the huge old restaurant kitchen, these words from Fritz Perls. This is the first day of the rest of your life. Each time I walk through the doors, I see those words and shake my head in wonder. I am no longer the scared little girl who hid out in marriage. I have changed, and the changes inside me have set in motion a series of events so new as to seem unreal. I feel like an actress, just pretending to be this newly liberated female, doing my own thing, hanging out with others as much as I want, then going off to write in my journal about what is happening and how I feel about it inside. I am standing at the huge old double sink with a man, someone I don't know well, but who has been partnered with me for this meal. That's the rule we've devised at our weekly community meetings. Two people on each dinner, both to make it and to wash up afterwards. One, a woman, presumably the expert, and the other a man, her apprentice. I am washing, he is drying. This particular man seems nice enough, doesn't seem to resent the task, indeed treats it as a sort of novelty. I'll bet, when was the last time he did the dishes? Some of the men are more testy, they balk, don't like it one bit, still think doing the dishes is beneath them. We are part of an experimental summer commune in Manomet, Massachusetts, occupying a huge old hotel sitting atop a cliff above a long private ocean beach, the Hotel Idlewild. A fitting name as we are both idle and wild, at least according to our uptight, suspicious neighbors. On any given early morning, I see at least one person sprawled at one of the long kitchen tables, coffee in hand, looking exhausted, but transfigured, as if he has just come back from a journey to an exotic foreign land filled with the wonder of what he has seen. He is back among us now, and, like Plato's enlightened one who must go back into the cave where his fellows sit watching shadows on the wall, our traveler, too, finds it difficult to talk, to express the mysteries to which he has been privy. Our bedraggled wanderer has just returned from a trip on acid or mescaline or peyote. The rest of us are respectful, knowing ourselves how it feels to have gone so far out as to have participated in a reality entirely other than the normal one. There is a giant steel grill on which we fry eggs and French toast. People wander in and out. Kids and dogs and watermelon seeds and the constant presence of sand underfoot. No matter how many times the kitchen is swept, the sand keeps drifting in. Flies buzz the leftover scraps sitting on paper plates on the long tables. The entire scene seems always on the verge of chaos. Chapter 8 July 1971 doing the dishes at the same sink, one summer later. This time with my lover, Tracy. I love to do dishes with him, love to do everything with him, am obsessed with him, made sure he was down in the community calendar as my partner in this task, want to be with him always, want to do dishes with him till death do us part. I brush aside the slight but nagging feeling he protects me, yes, and I need it, I love it, but he also patronizes me, not just in doing the dishes with me. Tracy is another one who treats it as a novelty. I can tell he thinks of himself as a good sport, but in other ways, too. He reminds me of my father. Same upright moral attitude, same judgments, same wall I am determined to break through. Chapter 9 July, 1972. Another summer on the Manamut Beach, this time in a cottage with three others, two women and a man. I am looking good, feeling good. I have recovered from the despair of last winter, wanting Tracy so bad I could taste it, furious at him, at my father, at life, which seemed so unfair. Spring brought me back from the dead. That and Terence, who visits on weekends, and who told me, 
on first meeting back in April. Your eyes spit fire. Long blonde hair flowing down my back, body taut, firmed, tanned. My outer appearance more and more reflects this marvelous new sense of freedom in my life. I stand at the kitchen sink, rinsing out the giant wok we use to cook all our meals. Got to be careful not to get soap on it. Another vegetarian meal, prepared by my housemates, all of whom are more advanced in this area than I. This is my first vegetarian summer, and I am amazed at how much lighter and better I feel not eating meat. I feel so good, really, really good, even smug. I am the only female in this house to have a boyfriend. No, I'm the most desirable female here, and flaunt it. Wear long romantic dresses to the dinner table. Run on the beach daily in my black bikini. And in the afternoons, I work on the final typing job for my doctoral dissertation in preparation for my orals in late August. Then on to California, where I've landed a plum teaching job in an experimental college. Sitting on top of the world, nothing can stop me now. Another long-term goal achieved. My two little boys wander into the kitchen, both whining, clutching at my long romantic dress. They beg me to go to the beach with them. Oh, all right, I sigh, impatient with their needs. I'll come to the beach with you. After all, they won't be here much longer, only this week in July, and in the fall they will live with their father for the entire school year. At least that way they can remain in the same school, be with friends they've always known. The sad, scared looks on their faces. I can't stand it. Hate to look at them, to see the way they look at me. Chronically tensed against my own feelings, I dry my hands and follow them to the beach. I am 29 years old. Chapter 10, April 1973. Standing at the sink of a large L-shaped suburban house in San Rafael, California. Outside, eucalyptus trees sway in the wind, doing dishes with my lover, Bob, another teacher in this highly experimental college. We hardly notice our task, so manic is our analysis of the president's sudden shocking announcement that the next meeting of the new college board of trustees is not going to be open to the public. A secret meeting? They're going to hold a secret meeting. The one thing they said they'd never do. The one thing everybody around here agrees means death to a truly experimental college. Why? What is going on? What don't they want us to know about? The television drones on in the next room. A bunch of students are over, glued to the Watergate hearings. I bend over the sink, my body trying to curl up in a ball. Feel like I've just been kicked in the solar plexus. A deep, dark sense of foreboding floods my interior. One of the students who lives in the house with us wanders in. We ask him anxiously, what does he know about what's going on? John happens to be the one student member on the board of trustees. Normally unusually open and loving, John seems evasive. I search his eyes and face for clues while he mouths reassurances. Don't worry about it, he says, putting his arm around me. They just need to feel they're doing a good job. They want to be able to say whatever they want to each other without feeling constrained by the presence of others. Bob and I both snort. Suspicious. Our bodies are tensed, unnaturally alert, as if for flight. Chapter 11, December 1973. Standing at the kitchen sink of another communal house in San Rafael, I live in the basement, appearing upstairs only for meals. I have told them that I will do all the dishes. This way I can discharge any lingering feeling of obligation to these people for their kindness, and I can do it without thinking. Just do it, get it over with, and go back downstairs. Doing the dishes listlessly, not paying much attention to them or my appearance or anyone else in the room, they are all trying to be helpful, these former students of mine, but there's nothing they can do. Three months ago, I was fired. 
they said I was too experimental for this experimental college. Bob was fired too. He's using his anger to write a book about it. I'm just drifting down into depression. Chapter 12, May 1974. Several miles east of Mendocino, a shady wooden lodge in the middle of a forest. I live here with a dozen others, all of us in transition from whatever we were to whatever we will be next. None of us have any idea who that is. We are all more or less spaced out, feeling like outcasts from the world we knew before. People who have nowhere to go, no function in the so-called real world. This lodge, we laugh ruefully, is our halfway house. I'm standing at the kitchen sink, doing the dishes with Sarah, whose doctor husband left her and his busy practice to dress in a clown suit and wander the streets of Mendocino. Sarah is in love with Spencer, a gnomic little man, probably alcoholic, whose Bible is the Urantia book. Spencer plays the old upright piano in the dark living room spontaneously, without knowing how to read music, and he's embarking on a quixotic campaign to become governor of California. I am in love with Spencer, too, but I don't tell Sarah that. Instead, as she hands me the dirty dishes, I draw her out, want to gain her trust, knowing whether or not Spencer is responding to her. Too bad, I commiserate with her, that Spencer doesn't seem to even notice her. Spencer doesn't notice me, either. That doesn't stop either of us from our secret fantasy love, or me from using my feminine wiles to compete with this good woman for a man who is hardly worth it. Chapter 13, October 1974. Five months have gone by. I am standing at the kitchen sink of a modest suburban house in my old hometown in Idaho. This house sits two blocks from the big L-shaped one my parents built. Two blocks in the other direction sits the big one Dick's parents built at around the same time. And out the back window of this house, a view of the high school we both attended. I am peeling carrots and potatoes, looking out the window in front of the sink, watching for him to come home from work. It's the day after our marriage a storybook surprise wedding which we held here in our home and during which both sets of parents wept for joy and in relief. Dick and Anne back together again. Finally, a dream come true. They never should have left each other in the first place. Thank God we don't have to worry about them anymore. I hear his little slate green fiat before it appears in the window. The excitement I feel and have felt ever since I was 13 years old, each time I catch another glimpse of this man, my love, my true love forever, seizes me now. One glimpse of his face in the car window and my body shudders to a quick, sharp, tender reminder of the thrust of his entering me tonight, tomorrow night, all other nights of my life. I am eternally astonished and immensely grateful for our great good fortune to have found each other again after 12 long years. Yes, yes, to be finally in each other's arms forever. His large, beautiful body uncoils from the tiny sedan. He sees me in the window. He grins. That wonderful flash of unusually fine and even white teeth, which I remember from high school, the high school of which the lawns roll on forever in back of this house, the high school halls we strolled within, hand in hand, 14 years ago. I remember, I remember, and in remembering, I feel myself circling back, coming back home to our hometown, to Dick, to myself, to our original plan for our common life. How did we go so far off track? What angel guided us so gently back again? He gets out of the car, and seeing my face framed in the kitchen window, my eyes burning with the intensity of memory, he grins, that familiar grin, large, generous, white. But now I see it differently. He is grinning in triumph, as if to say, 
Ah, yes, now I've got you. At last, now I've got you now. He is walking by the window on the way to the front door, still grinning. Suddenly, my mood shifts. I am seized with a convulsive shudder. Something has taken me over, sending me reeling, a fear so large and overwhelming that I have to clutch the sink or I will fall to the ground, faint. As he opens the door, I rush through the kitchen into the living room. My unconscious has me in its grip. I am no longer myself. I am a wild, stormy night, a force of nature so powerful that even he, my big, beautiful new husband, is shoved backwards by my fists. They are pounding on his chest uncontrollably. Tears of love, of agony, of frustration, tears of rage stream down my face. Oh my God, here I am again, married, married. He looked at me like he owned me. We have been taken over by the social forces around us, the ones that dominate this smug little town, crushing all true individuality. I have married my true love. I have married him. I am no longer myself, free, but his wife. Chapter 14, March. 1979. I have just finished the twice weekly ritual of bread making. Four heavy little brown loaves, so full of raisins and seeds and nuts and bran, that one piece is a whole meal. I place two of them on the counter near the back door. The first two people to enter get them, simmering on the stove the perpetual pot of soup, free for the taking. I love this rambling little house my doctor lover bought me. Munchkin house, we call it. And I see it not just as my house, but our house, everybody's house. A house open to community. What my doctor lover has given me, I must give back. Standing at the sink, washing the grease out of the big silver bread bowl, I reflect on the magic of my life, how grateful I am that Dick and I were able to work things out to the point where, despite our great love, we both could honor my even greater need for freedom, and where I, without reserve, could then encourage his getting together with a good friend of mine, marrying her and leaving town. And how perfect the setup here, a real laboratory for this experiment in utopia. My bedroom, bathroom, and study, all in one wing, set off from the rest of the place. Above the kitchen sink, a funky circle cut out of the plaster wall reveals morning light streaming into the tiny breakfast room beyond. Down the hall, my friend Brenda teaches in her studio, a large room with its own outside entrance. The three potter's wheels and homemade kiln out back are brand new. Again, thanks to my lover, whatever I ask for, he provides. Downstairs, the production offices of Open Space, a non-profit community tabloid magazine designed to open up the space within this smug little town and the surrounding countryside. I want to give something back to my hometown before I leave for places unknown. Want to realize my dream of an ideal world, or at least of a real community, in which everyone feels free to express him or herself fully, openly, without fear. We gather for editorial meetings at the round table in the living room, six to eight of us usually, reading what has been submitted, deciding the flow of the pages, which artists need to be called, assigning each other production tasks. The night before we go to press, I write the editorial, encouraging others to submit their essays, ideas, poetry, drawings, showing how the theme for this issue was not decided, but discovered by looking over what has been submitted and finding the commonality, that which links our various individual expressions together, our common sense, the sensing which we all have in common. People think me poetic, but what I see is real. At night, I dream of a vast cloud hovering over the town, enclosing the dreams of people sleeping down below, fusing them together, forging that mystic body of Christ, sacred community of souls, both source of and latest form for, one mind, one soul, 
one vast heart beating through us all. By day, I see the same in the pages of open space, the various poems and drawings and articles so divergent and quirky, revealing so many different levels of education, of literacy, of style and talent, of heart, of psychological and other kinds of understanding. Squinting my eyes, I allow myself to lose focus, opening to receive through peripheral vision that familiar dizzying sensing of the field of energy in which all these expressions coexist, in which all their authors coexist, suspended, subtly supporting and blending with one another, creating and sustaining and opening further that vast yawning space of the spirit surging through us all. I don't speak of my visions of open space to any but the inner circle of open space people, and even with them, I find it hard to describe the glory. I don't need to speak at all. The magazine shows its own value. This utopian experiment seems to be working. We have been lauded by the local radio talk show, the local newspaper. The mailbox is full. People call or drop over. We are discovering a well of eccentricity and even of true originality in this high desert town. Who would have realized the sheer number and diversity of the real individualists somehow surviving in this community where social and economic life is dominated by organized religion? All these oddballs, hiding in their closets for years, dreaming of a more open world from behind closed doors, and now, with hardly any prodding, they are not only coming out, they are rejoicing to find each other. One day we are sitting working in the living room and a pickup truck backs up to the door off the breakfast nook. An old farmer gets out, opens up the back, and drags two 50-pound sacks of beans out and into the kitchen pantry. For the soup, he says, grinning. We don't get paid for our services on the magazine, and yet we all keep doing it. The unusual sense of community this project generates is priceless. Most amazing of all, the actual production costs seem to work magically. There's always exactly enough money donated to put out the next issue. No more and no less.